and we're recording. <clears throat> well, welcome everyone to the um, March 2nd School Board Budget Workshop. Um, it's our third budget workshop for those of you who've been following along at home. Um, our next one is on March, uh, March 23rd. And before we get started tonight, I just want to, um, again, quickly go over our budget goals. I think it's helpful just to remind ourselves on what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and uh, the first one is to move CSD forward with our strategic plan goals, empower students with the academic, personal, and social knowledge and skills to build balanced and purposeful lives, ensure equity and access, access to opportunities for all CAPE students, and that we will reflect a careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. And first, we're gonna, as we as we have been doing, we're gonna see if there's any citizen comments regarding the budget itself. Um, I'm just gonna see if there's anyone. Okay, we do have a few have attendees. Some, we do have three uh, attendees. Yeah, we do have a few. If anyone would like to speak on the budget, um, just raise your use the raise your hand function. Not seeing any. Okay, great. And there will be opportunities for the public to comment at future meetings and we'll have a, a public hearing, in fact, at a certain point. Um, the next item on the agenda is really a follow-up from last week. So we wanted to give board members an opportunity to review the written comments that the administrators had provided us and to, for our comment from our questions last week. Um, and then we had a few board members who had submitted a couple of questions ahead of time to give administrators an opportunity to, res to respond to those before tonight and that was that was um i think you all should have gotten the written link a link to a written uh comments earlier today um how about first just i'm going to actually follow up from last week so i want to see if there are any and then we'll get into this the, the questions that were submitted are there any questions from the board following up now that you've had a chance to review the written materials other than what has been submitted Okay, let's go right into the follow-up budget questions, the written ones that were submitted. And, and when we get to the end of this, I'm gonna ask board members once one more time if they have some additional questions I, um, before we move into Marcy's presentation. So the first, the first question was to Jeff. Chad. Um, the question, yeah, if you, if, you, if you have that in front of you, Jeff, you could just go ahead. Uh, so I don't have it specifically in front of me, Phil, but I'll paraphrase it and correct me if I, if I, if I get off on the gist of it. It was essentially whether in addition to the proposal for a one-year math science person um, to help fill any gaps in, in those areas, whether there was any proposed expenditures related to other academic needs or social emotional needs. Mm -hmm. and, and the answer in, in a nutshell is no. Um, I expanded just a tiny bit and said that, you know, our teachers and our counselors and others are working really hard right now to try to minimize the, both needs um, along both lines. And we've got some great people who are ready and able to do that. They're working on it hard now. And I know they will be doing planning and working in the summer and early fall to try to help us with that. So in short, I, I did not propose and nor do I think we need any additional resources that would cost additional money. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Cindy has a follow-up question. I just wanted to add a comment and I understand if they haven't had an opportunity to prepare. That was my question. And I actually was looking for responses from uh, like Troy and Jason regarding that. Um, I know that Jeff had addressed it through the preseason math, but um, outside of that program at the high school, I wondered if there were programs at the other school or any anything specific. Jason, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, could you please just restate the yeah. question? Thanks. I, I've got it in front of me, Cindy, if you want me to read it for everyone to, okay. who are maybe listening. The question was right. the preseason math program, and I apologize, I actually directed to Jeff, so I, I didn't fully understand what it went to. 
the question was the preseason math program sounds like a great solution to address skill gaps. In addition to the preseason math at the high school and ESY services for special education, does the budget include any other programs to address academic or social emotional needs prior to the return to school in the fall? So the answer for pawn Cove at this time is no. Okay. And Troy is without electricity and he's dealing with this generator. So um, he's not with us right now. Um, he was hoping to come in later, but I'm not sure that's gonna happen either. So um, I don't, I know Kyle's here um, as an attendee and I'm not gonna put him on the spot, but I don't believe that there's anything at the middle school um, pre, pre the start of school um, in the budget. Any other further follow up, Cindy? Can I? No, thank you. Okay. Can I speak? Heather. Um, just to follow through with that, a little bit of my interpretation um, was the idea came from Jeff, I believe, sort of as like a preseason, like high school kids are already used to that sort of finding that time and ending summer a little bit earlier and they're anticipating that. So um, I do appreciate the question, Cindy. And at the same time, like um, I, I definitely <clears throat> see it, though it is an interesting concept for Pond Cove in the middle school, for sure. I, I see it as a very easy, seamless fit for the high school. So I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. The next question, again, if you're the person who asked, and I could, this could be Cindy again, I, I uh, did my best trying to direct it to the right person, but I, I did this next question as a sort of Donna slash Perry combination. And the question was how much space in our buildings cannot be used for academic instruction due to ventilation issues? As we all know, many schools have turned closets and storage into instructional spaces, which they were not designed for. And is there anything that can be done if we are awarded relief funds to increase usable space? And I took advantage of that question and answered it uh, with, I feel very little space could be gained as we are using just about all the areas to their maximum availability. The remaining spaces that were not addressed or that are not addressed in the ventilation project would need to continue as areas of storage due to the lack of this as well. So basically in short, we've, by the end of this project, we will have just about used every available space um, that is worth making the investment into. There might be a couple small, what, what still should be a closet, but overall, um, like, like we've done with middle school in Pond Cove, we've actually made spaces in hallway areas. So we, we're, we're maxed out. And anything that is storage now, I would leave as storage because that is just as important for our teacher supplies and things as well. I have a brief follow-up on that, Perry. Um, you mentioned hallway space and we've gotten a couple questions from the community about hallways and um, building code issues. Could you just touch upon that? The limitations to using hallways? Yeah, it sounds like you did find some circumstances to use them, but other were not allowed to, right? For the well, building. Yeah, and I'll give the examples. Uh, both at Middle School and Pond Cove, there were little alcove areas that you could see. Uh, for instance, the Middle School has what we call Academic Row, and it's a long hallway of just office areas. But in between some of those office areas, there were two alcoves that were designed for students to just sit in and look out the window. But when you looked at the blueprint from a, from a, like an aerial view above, you could see that it was really had the potential of just being a straight row of offices just by putting walls in and closing those alcoves. They had the ventilation in them, they had the sprinkler heads, uh, electric available, heat, everything we needed, just not a wall and a door. Uh, those are areas that we can take advantage of. When you start encroaching on the available, or the actual hallway space, then you run into code issues when, um, you know, the hallway needs to be a certain uh, width and uh, can't be, can't have any obstructions in it where somebody with a, um, a visual disability, um, 
you know, would create an obstruction for them in an emergency type of situation. That's mm -hmm. where you run into these instances where it would be a code issue. Uh, for the most part, I think we've done everything we can in the buildings. Uh, I know at Pond Cove and the middle school, um, there might be a few available spaces in the high school, but again, yeah, it, would, it would be very limited. Thanks, yeah, no, that's helpful. Any other follow-ups to Perry on that? Okay. Um, the next question um, was uh, addressed to Donna. The, the pandemic has caused a lot of stress on the district and has exposed weaknesses that were not previously evident. What do you think are the top three weaknesses the pandemic has exposed and how are they addressed in this budget? Okay, so Marcy answered this question. And I, I agree with her. Um, about these things that are uh, that are in the budget, but I think the <clears throat> number one uh, exposed weakness, and it's not really exposing it because we already knew it was there, but are our facilities because um, they have really um, not allowed us to get more students into the building. They're really uh, a terrific roadblock. So I would say number one, two, and three for me are facilities, facilities, and facilities. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> um, but of course, we haven't really addressed that in the budget. So there's two different parts of this mm -hmm. of this question. But but really, um, our small classrooms. Uh, small halls, uh, the eating situation at the Pond Cove and Middle School. Um, one, one of the number one things that um, is, a, is a roadblock right now is feeding students six feet apart with the so social distancing. So I, I think we would be in a lot different space if we had two separate cafeterias and weren't sharing kitchens and cafeterias. So I would yeah. say number one, two, and three are, are facilities, facilities, and facilities. However, um, with our, um, with our, our data uh, from NWA, it's looking like math is going to be the area, the content area that, uh, in which we have the most needs. So um, our uh, inclusion of math interventionists in the budget is, is extremely appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. Substitutes. Um, we've been very fortunate. Our staff has um, not come in when they're sick, but um, they've been um, really uh, diligent about uh, coming in. So substitutes hasn't been a huge issue. Um, but if we had uh, a, a large quarantine situation, which could happen at any time, um, you know, that, that could uh, make us switch to remote. So um, that full-time substitute teacher for Pond Cove, I know would be very valuable. And um, the area of technology we did have, um, the pandemic did reveal a lot of our weaknesses in technology, which weren't really there until we had the pandemic. Um, and so uh, including um, addressing technology in our budget uh, is extremely important, so. Thanks, anyone but want to have any follow-ups to Donna on that? Uh, yeah, Elizabeth. Um, so I wanted to sort of agree and disagree with Donna at the same time, because I think we are trying to address the facilities in the budget with, with the $300,000 for that's true. Well, that's schematic. True. So right. I felt yeah. like we, we can't, there's no quick addressing that, but we're, we're doing what we can, right? That, that is true. <laughs> so, but I, I agree with you one, two, and three facilities, facilities, facilities. And I know we have been lucky with subs and, and that's fantastic. And it also looks like um, when we put out, Heather in particular put out a plea at the beginning of the school year for the, the community to support us and sign up to be substitutes. I think a lot more um, parents and community members did that this year, it seems like. Yeah, we increased our sub pay too. And I think that, that was huge. Yeah. Do you, I'll just do a quick follow-up because hands are flying all over the place. But <laughs> <laughs> um, do you foresee... Um, lowering that sub pay because I wouldn't think we would do that I think you well put it up and keep uh, it there but Marcy's been keeping really a close track of our sub line 
Um, and I know that um, we're getting in a questionable, questionable situation, but uh, we're going to hold strong as long as we can in that. So we may have to reduce it, but hopefully not. Thank you. Jen. Donna, just a quick follow up to the technology piece. Um, will we be able to address some of those technology pieces in, in the spring through any relief funds? And what other oh, yes. oh, yes. what other technology issues do we see as hurdles going into um, next year? So our, our big challenge now is um, waiting for Milty up in Augusta to figure out figure out what they're going to do for that. Um, whether they're going to fund the Milty project or not, and that will we have our um, and I don't, I don't think that Noel's here, no. Um, we have our purchasing of equipment sort of on a rotating basis. And we always use that melting money as a huge part of that rotation. And so we're just, we're waiting to hear and we just haven't heard anything about whether they're gonna fund it or not. So um, I know that Noel has a question mark and that's the question mark is what is Milty going to do? Um, so we're, we're waiting to hear about that. But if that, that's about the replacement, the continual replacement of equipment, of devices so that we can um, keep our devices up to date. Does that answer your question, Jen? I just didn't know if when we were talking about the, <clears throat> the top three, you know, the problems or the, debt, the, ch the hurdles, if there was any other technology hurdles we had to get over for um, the next school year. Uh, I think basically we're in pretty good shape with technology. The COVID funds um, really helped us out with that. So um, we do have some, uh, some installation of um, whiteboards and such that, that we uh, still need to take care of. And uh, we, were, we were hoping to use some of our COVID money that we still have left over for that, but we haven't committed it yet, so. Kimberly. Thank you so much. Um, I had, um, I guess, two questions. Um, one, where um, I, I see that we're addressing or attempting to address the math um, challenges that we've experienced um, in the budget for next year. If the spring NWEA results show that the deficit's greater than we anticipate, um, do we feel that what we budgeted for can handle greater disparity or do we, I don't know, do we have an, a backup plan or any, any thoughts on that? And then my other thought is, um, I know we had the, um, I, I was just wondering about addressing social emotional needs. Are we um, in a capacity that we're sufficiently able to do that right now? I know we, we added the second social um, or guidance counselor, I guess, at the elementary school this past year. And last year, we filled the social work position at the middle school. So I, I think those probably filled the gaps pretty well, but just wondering if you could comment on that. Jed, do you want to, uh, Jed, <laughs> I switched to my son, Jed. Uh, Jason, <laughs> do, <laughs> do you want to take that for Pond Cove, um, the interventionist piece and the... Um, I can't. Uh, yeah, I can do that. So with the interventionist piece, <clears throat> although, I mean, I think it is always um, wise to think about worst case scenario, but I think I'm pretty confident that um, given the new, this, the additional interventionist position at Pond Cove that we would be covered um, to meet the needs, um, particularly, you know, I think having the second interventionist teacher would, would cover us for the tier three that we might need the most intense support. And if needed, um, our RTI ed techs who um, provide tier two support could focus more on math and literacy for a year, like could prioritize math support. So I'd be pretty comfortable that we would have a really good team um, of RTI um, folks and the um, counselor, I mean, we're, we're just really pleased. And I feel like we are, um, we have what we need. And, you know, it's, it's a really good balance right now. I think our two counselors are working nonstop, um, but I think they're doing a great job. And I think they can meet the needs of our, of our school um, next year. In addition, they're, they're, 
really close teammates with our social workers as well. Um, so we feel um, like we don't have too much, but we don't have, we finally um, have enough. Uh, so I think we'll be good. And I know at the middle school that um, they have, uh, that, that students are working with a, a, a SEND program um, during win time. So they've already started addressing um, the math issues at the uh, middle school. And Jeff, how about at the high school? Well, it's a it's a hard hypothetical question to ask <laughs> ask to answer, Kimberly, because it depends uh, what what the gap is that might be revealed. Um, but within the reasonable range of what I would anticipate would be the would be the math losses. I think I think we're good, um, and I and I think we're good in terms of the social emotional supports as well for students. So. I feel comfortable where, where we will be if the budget is passed with the increase that's been proposed. Excellent, thank you. I, I recognize it's a difficult hypothetical. I'm just wondering, wanting to make sure that we're adequately uh, prepared, so thank you. Any other follow-up questions on that one? I guess I, I have one, Donna. Um, mentioned the uh, substitute, the, the full-time substitute position, which was proposed last year. We did not include it, but then obviously we had some COVID money that ended up funding it. It's now inc included again. Have we thought about whether we're going to, you know, whether there's an opportunity to have COVID funding come in again, again to fund positions like that and the rules around it? It's, it's not something that you can use, right? I think you told us already you can't use the money for positions that are already included in your budget. No. So that's it's sort of a Difficult balancing act, it seems to me. Yeah, what we hear is that the rules are, well, if, if the funding comes through, and I, I didn't hear what happened, if anything, in the summit today with the bill, but um, they're expecting the money to come through. Um, and, it, and they said that it will probably be the same, under the same rules as before. So, um, so it's, you know, it's a chance we take, and Marcy and I have talked about with this with the math interventionist position. You know, that COVID funding, that's, that would be perfect for what that's meant for, but it's going to be a timing. Um, it's gonna be the luck of the timing because if we put it in the budget, the COVID money won't be able to cover it. But if we don't put it in the budget, we could use COVID money, which would be great because it would reduce our budget, but we're, we may be taking a chance. So um, we're right. going to have to watch that carefully about whether we keep it in or take it out. And, you know, we can make a, a change at the last moment, but um, that's going to be a timing piece. And I don't know if the timing is going to work out so that it will be clear. I see. And the same, I would say, I assume the same is for the math interventionist programs. The math interventionist, in yes, yes. But yes. Yep. Okay. I have a question on that. So Donna, remind yeah. us, when did we find out that we got that COVID money this past year? What was the timing like this past year? This past year? Well, it's really dependent on when the bills go through. Um, when um, we, we found out well after the budget was passed. Yeah. Uh, can you remember, Mars? I can't even remember when it was. Um, I believe the first one was August. And then we got word for the second large grant in October. Yeah. Early October. And you so, remember, first we thought we had to spend the first one by December 31st, and that was looming. Um, everybody was scrambling to spend their money by December 31st, and then they gave us an extension, uh, a well welcome extension. <laughs> um, so it's it's really a moving target, but we are expecting to hear um, if the Senate, if it's passed in the Senate and it goes all goes through, um, we're expecting to hear as soon as that is all settled. So. And sorry, when is that looking? When is that date? When is when are we expecting to hear? Just expecting, but we don't know when. We don't know when. No idea. Okay. Nope. No, and we know the, the president is in the trying to get it done by, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's an unemployment benefits extension they need to do by the middle of March. I think so that's their goal, whether they get it done or not. Okay. Yeah. So we're hoping for yeah. some luck. Yeah. Before we 
finalize things. Yeah. But Mark, to follow up on Laura's question, it was a good is that the we found out in those those first two tranches mm -hmm. fairly quickly, if I remember, after those bills passed, right? There was a fairly quick turnaround. Yeah, yeah, it was. Once the those bills was, passed at the fair level. Yeah. The state was ready with their application process and it, they have already said it will be the same application process. So um, I believe they are, they're ready um, to distribute uh, as soon as they find out for sure, or they're ready okay. to accept applications. And we will be ready to apply. Good. All right, I don't see any other. I'm gonna move on to the next question, which was, Directed to Marcy, although others can chime in, which was the best, what is the best course of action to, remedi to remediate the food deficit? Great, thank you, Phil. And Peter, I see you're here. So um, when I'm finished, you feel free to jump in and add to this as well, if you um, have anything to add. I, I wanted to say that I believe that we are doing the best thing we can do right now, which is to incrementally increase the contribution from property taxes each year so that we can ultimately end a positive year-end balance for school nutrition and feeding the children. We currently fund the school nutrition program to transfer from the general fund to the school nutrition fund. And the amount we have budgeted, we've increased from the previous years to start towards this effort is 100,000. But I believe that if we start to increase over the next few years to get to a contribution of 200,000 that we would have a positive year-end cash position for the school nutrition program. And in addition to that, I know that Peter and his team are busy um, constantly applying to uh, with a program Full Plates Full Potential, which is a grant program. So receiving the additional grants and, and staying steady with the state subsidy that's offered at this point I think that that would be our best course of action at this point. And that is, that extra $100,000 is included in the proposed budget, budget at this point, is that right? Right now, Phil, we have the flat 100,000 that we've had from this current year. So we mm -hmm. don't have an additional amount right now. Toward, okay. So my proposal is that once we get through this budget year, um, we'll, I think we should start seriously, maybe at least by next year, considering increasing the subsidy, the, the contribution that we make from property taxes at that point. I know it's a lot for you all to consider for this year with the deficit. So I, I don't think that, um, I didn't want you to be overwhelmed with considering both, but I think that by this June, we will see also another uh, deficit that we will have to handle the next budget process and maybe at that point we can then address once we make some decisions this year look towards making that decision to incrementally increase the the contribution made i know it can't be all done in one year and it because it's such a hard thing but um i think over a few years we should get into a good position mm -hmm. peter do you agree with that he probably does. I'm thinking he does. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay, great. Yes, Peter and I have been watching the trend every month, and I've been trying to do some forecasting methods and trying to calculate what error and forecasting trend we're looking at, trying to adjust. So I think that we're getting really close to being able to get a handle on it within the next year or two. And don't forget, we're not alone. School nutrition and feeding the children is um, a well-known fact to be a really uh, important, critical aspect of education and hard. So we're, these are really hard things that we're hearing, but everybody is hearing them uh, across our state and across the country. And uh, we are in a really good position compared to our neighbors. So I know that these are hard numbers to hear, but I want you to know that you are in a a good situation and we will get there. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced we're going to get there. Thank you. Does anyone have any follow-up questions to that? Okay. Um, final final pre-submitted question. Um, what percent of the budget represents additional funds related to COVID response and addressing gaps to student needs, extra staff support facilities issues, can you provide a single view of those items? 
Sure. The single view I have is that right now our budget approximately represents of 1.33% of the amount needed to cover the COVID response issues. And they happen to really kind of relate to the issues that Donna touched on. We have the positions, the math interventionist position, the full-time substitute, and I believe that also recognizing the need to transition to the director of education, um, what do we call director of edu educational technology. technology. Yes, I believe that is also what we would want to consider as part of our uh, part of our COVID response. So the total amount is 1.33 percent, which is almost it's 400 thousand. $407,000 in our budget. That's just trying to get to what we've discussed um, in the, the hot topics that we're talking about right now. The math interventionists, the substitutes, and the technology needs. Anyone else have anything on that they'd like to hear some follow-up on? Okay. And I, I just wanted to add to Phil on this. This number also represents what, what Don and I are watching closely when we hear about this legislation and any kind of funding coming our way. This would be the amount, all of these things perfectly would um, be part of the application process for any new money. So as Donna had said earlier, this is what we're keeping our eye on to be able to pr present to you as items that could be covered with uh, COVID relief money. Mm -hmm. And Thank so you. we're going to hope for that. Okay. All right, great. Um, before we move on to Marcy's other presentations, any other questions from the board generally at this point? Yes, Elizabeth. So um, this question is really kind of to the board. Um, after our last budget meeting, I took a little time to reflect and I realized that um, we might be kind of missing a priority. And so I just kind of wanted the board to think about something, which is um, should the board update our FY22 budget goals to include prioritizing full-time in-person learning? Um, if it's something that the board feels strongly about and something that the, the board wants to prioritize, then it would seem kind of important that it was part of our goals and it's nothing that we can vote on in workshop, but I just wanted to bring that up and have people think about, um, because it, I mean, how the budget is built and we go through and match it to our goals. And if we are, um, you know, if we're thinking that we might, might need to make some shifts in budgeting um, to consider different plans and different scenarios for the 21-22 um, school year, um, there there might be some there might have to be some give and take, and the explanation would have to be aligned with our goals. Right. So I wanted to bring that up, and you know, I know that we can have discussion. We can't vote, but it's a thought. Yeah, it's, it's a great thought. Does anyone have any thoughts from the board on that? Yeah, Kimberly. I, I just this is more a question and um, and and you're probably not in a position to answer it at this point, Donna, but um, just wondering cost wise what we might be looking at um, to to try and make that a reality. Um, so we have, we have been doing some research in the last couple of days and um, one of the things that we researched was um, portables and how much would it cost um, to provide and how many portables would we need? So I started um, just thinking about uh, Pond Cove and uh, with social distancing um, requirements, I'm switching to call them requirements now and not guidelines um, because guidelines are being misinterpreted but with the requirements uh, for social distancing um, it would re require it at Pond Cove basically splitting each whole class in half um, so I looked into the portables Marcy did some um, 
some research on on how much it would cost. And bottom line, um, to rent portables for a year just for Pond Cove, we would need we would need um, fifth, approximately fifteen portables. Uh, would be about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars for rentals, and that does not include um, the setup. The setup would be about um, it's about fifteen thousand dollars per portable. Uh, and then the takeaway um, would be about, um, I think it's 24,000 per portable. No, that's that uh, right? 12, yeah, 12,000. 12, 12,000, I was doubling that, yeah, 12,000. And um, then we look at staffing and to provide double staffing, uh, which is basically what we need, what we would need just at Pond Cove would be, um, and we were figuring um, a, approximately 80,000 uh, per staff member based on uh, salaries and benefits um, would cost 2,400,000 to staff that for a year. Um, I stopped there um, figuring that, that the middle school would be approximately the same as that. Um, that is a, a lot of money and we were, uh, the, the Cumberland County um, superintendents were talking on Friday with um, a liaison from the state and they felt that we would probably get, if the COVID money comes through double um, what we got in the large um, COVID grant. So we got, we got approximately um, a, a million dollars. So we're looking at, $2 million from COVID um, funds. So just for just the staffing at Pond to do Pond Cove in portables would be well over that. Um, we also did some research into tents and um, tenting companies we found don't uh, distribute their tents until April because they don't want the snow to ruin their tents. So that would not be a year round option even if we could heat them, um, but they do collect, they do come and collect their tents with a threat of snow. So it would probably be, I imagine end of October, um, mid-October that they would come and collect their tents. So that would leave us with all those classes of students that we had nothing to do with. So we're also, um, and tents are um, for a 40 by 60 pole tent, Oh, from April 15th to June 16th, um, there are $6,000. Uh, that would be toward for the end of the year. So they're about um, $2,000 uh, per tent. It looks like that's those were your numbers, Marcy. So yeah, that's um, correct. That's rent, right. Yeah, for rental. Um, so that wouldn't help us in the wintertime with our, what to do with our students. We have started looking into buildings and rooms that are available um, around Cape Elizabeth. And we have found um, the Wex building, which is over by the airport, uh, might be a possibility for moving a large chunk of our students. That presents a whole nother uh, set of issues like um, transportation, nursing, feeding students, um, safe, the safety piece, and we haven't gone to look at, we'll, um, I think Marcy and I will go on a, a tour of these air, these pieces of property. We do have a commercial um, realtor who is working on this and we don't have any prices as yet. So anyway, that's where we are um, as far as numbers go with portables. And again, that, those um, portables, 15 portables, was that, that was Pond Cove? That was just Pond Cove. Okay. That was just, um, so 330,000 for rental plus 2,400,000 for staffing. Then uh, that's not including heat and electricity, um, which are Perry's departments. <laughs> we didn't even get yeah. into that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that each one of those would need a power hookup, 
plumbing hookup for restrooms, uh, handicap ramps built. Uh, you would need some type of maze of walkways built that goes from one structure to another for handicap accessibility as well. Um, all our athletic fields at the at the um, on the campus have underground um, watering systems that were installed by the town and not the school. Um, so that would probably be, end up being destroyed. So we would have to uh, also calculate in the replacement of that once we would move back to a normal type situation. And also with something similar to the WEX building, um, I thought about this after our meeting earlier today, but when you start going in that route for the younger grades, uh, looking at you know uh, K through four, um, the, the, those style of buildings aren't really meeting our needs because the, the elementary school is built for children. Um, you know, toilets are lower and things like that. And, and their availability is designed so that they're closer for the students where when you get start getting into an office building, I would say that would be geared more towards a high school age, mm -hmm. not so much the younger grades. That's all. Thank you. Heather. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to um, ask two questions, just wrapping my brain around this. So Donna, you were talking about portables and you were talking about um, how it would cost $2.4 million to staff. So I'm thinking um, maybe this is more for Jason. If we were to create double the staff for Ponco, that's roughly what, 30 teachers, give or take, at least. Right? No. Am I thinking right? Somewhere no. around 30. So, well, um, right? Because we would have to it's double. About, yeah, it's about 25. Um, and, and this is just a rough, rough estimate, but about 25 for Pon Teachers. more more for Pond Cove. And oh, then, okay. if we need to double and some then, special uh, ed. And then we would have to, we would have to double, um, we would have to double that probably for the middle school, so. Okay. Um, and I've heard of districts um, sort of contracting with UNE with students, ed students. Can you speak to that a little bit? Like, um, so I think in, in talking earlier, they were paying those um, education students 15,000. Um, however, um, they're not certified teachers and they, they can't give grades. Um, you have to be a certified teacher to um, bestow a grade for a, for a course or a class. So um, at that, at this, in this other district, they have um, assigned mentors to those teachers, certified teacher mentors. Um, who are overseeing those students, um, teachers. We did, um, we did participate in a, um, a program, uh, I guess it was before we went out for COVID, um, to try when we were having substitute issues and um, to try to get substitutes from uh, USM. And so there, there was um, a plan for having uh, USM students um, who were in the education program um, sign up to be substitutes and um, we didn't get anybody that signed up. So I think um, the student availability, um, and we could certainly look into it, but um, there would be some issues with that as well. And I'm not sure that we would um, get students from you. And could we, could we use long-term subs i mean i know when there's been somebody cannot, on maternity we, leave yeah we cannot hire long-term subs for um for a year um okay. we would have some issues with the association on that um so when okay. we hire someone and, and i believe there might be a state law as well but when you hire someone for um for taking a position for a year um you have to hire a teacher okay Thank you. And I see Elizabeth, you have a question, but I have one more quickly for Perry. Um, when we're talking about the 15 portables, that was my question.
question, where would we place them? And your thinking would be, I mean, the athletic fields, They're, that's really the only place, right? Right. Yeah. I, I haven't mapped that part out because we just started talking about it today. I don't know that you would get 15 of those on, you know, the ball field right off the side of the middle school, which would be right. the, the best location. So you're looking at soccer some, fields, maybe. Right. Like Capano and stuff. Right. Mm hmm. All right, thank you. Great, thanks, Heather. Elizabeth. Thank you. So um, my question was really more geared toward, um, after all that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and I appreciate that because I think that needed to come out. Like that's, that's all, like, I, I think the public needs to hear that just 15 portables and 25 to 30 teachers would cost us well over $3 million and use up our athletic fields, possibly, if we could even fit that many portables on our campus, when in reality, we would probably need 30 portables just at the Pond Cove Middle School. And then, you know, how do we deal with the high school? I mean, our campus really doesn't support it is what I'm hearing. <laughs> um, and, you know, what, what goes along with that? That means that sports are now canceled and you know, the safety and security issues and that sort of thing. But um, with regards to um, the UNE program, I, I guess I had a little bit of a question, not because I'm actually in favor of this. I did that UNE program for my teacher certification and it's not a huge program. I don't know if, if Bitterford is contracted with them that anybody else would be able to get teachers. Oh. Does anybody have a sense of like how many people are even at in in the, the later stages of that program because you can't I mean somebody just starting the program wouldn't you wouldn't want them coming in and teaching and mm -hmm. my class only had 50 like 50 teachers and you know we graduated 50. And Elizabeth when I worked in Biddeford they had a long-standing relationship with UNE so right. um, they've had practicum students in there I've had practicum students work with me they've been in there for years yeah so that's my understanding and I think it's helpful I'm, I'm not at all trying to contradict Donna and I appreciate that Jen has that experience too that um, it, it doesn't feel like a viable option for everybody in in southern Maine to just all of a sudden descend on UNE right. and take no. those um, <laughs> essentially student teachers but um so I actually really appreciate the research that was done, even though it's just initial. Um, and even talking about the WEX building, which um, again, I think about putting any children in there and um, the safety, the security, the nursing issue, the feeding issue. And even, even if we get a good commercial rate on renting that one building, we're still going to have um, the staffing, it doesn't, the staffing stays the same. Oh, if you yeah. double the classrooms, you have to double the staffing. And I appreciate that you were talking about the regular ed teachers, but I have to imagine if we've got offsite um, learning going on in a large group that we would have to have special ed services available. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have to figure out, you know, ed techs, you'd have to figure out, do you need to, you know, have another, um, how many special ed teachers do you have to double and, and add that into the budget? So it's just, there's a lot to consider if those um, physical distancing guidelines aren't relaxed or gotten rid of by the fall, I guess. Um, one scenario that um, I've heard talked about, and I'm wondering if you've heard anything about this, Donna, is, um, the likelihood that we we might be able to go back to school um, full you know full time in person um, with that relaxed social guide you know physical guidelines not physical guidelines physical distancing requirements you know relaxed or gone but the eating might still be the sticking point that they might keep the six foot rule for eating and so my question is. Is there, you know, is there a way to set aside funds in contingency or, you know, research into, I mean, trying to find a portable 
um, cafeteria structure, especially for the Ponco middle, middle school situation, probably would be a lot less difficult than trying to find 30 teachers and um, you know, all 25 teachers and 15 classrooms or something like that. So that was kind of a question that I had. Yeah, I, I don't know if they have portable um, buildings such as this. I, I haven't done any research on that. So I, I just, I really couldn't say, but certainly if they make them, it would be a great possibility because eating will be a challenge. So Donna, it sounds like if we wanted to explore any buildings like the WEX building or something else, the only way that we really are going to be able to make this effective is if we find somewhere that has rooms big enough to accommodate a full class to get over that staffing hurdle. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying. That, that was our thought. We've, we've talked to some churches in the area and they have um, rooms here and there um, that might also be available, but um, having students spread out all over the place would present other challenges. So, but you know, we'll continue to, to do our research and um, I don't know what size the, the rooms are at the WEX building. That's why I, Marcy and I would need to go and um, do a tour and see what's, you know, what's available there. So, um, but, you're right, if the rooms were big enough, it would um, eliminate the staffing problem. At least some of it. Great. I think this is helpful, I agree, Elizabeth. I think it's um, helpful for the members of the public to hear some of this. And I know we're talking about it tonight, but we have a grand total of two people, uh, no, four now. Um, so it'd be, it would be interesting to see if we could get this, uh, continue putting this kind of information out there, whether it's through one of our weekly, you know, one of the weekly emails, or maybe I know we have our standing COVID item on our board okay. meetings. Um, but something like that, I think even if it's a brief summary of what we just went over, I think that'd be helpful. So that there's some oh. concrete ideas. So people know that, first of all, that you've been doing this, re we've been doing this research and that what, what it would entail. I think that would be just helpful to get that information out there more broadly. Sure. Any other questions before we move on to Marcy's presentation? Well, I would say yes, the, Heather. Oh, oh, Laura and then Mars. Laura and then Heather. I would say the original question though was from Elizabeth. Should it be one of our goals when we talk about our budget? And because it does weigh into the budget, if we are we are actively looking at you know exploring different avenues, researching. I think it make it does make sense. I know we're not voting. But I think it does make sense for it to be a goal, um, something that yeah. we're striving towards. Because, you know, I can speak for myself that having kids full time in school is something that I want as a goal. So um, I think it makes right. sense to add it. And I don't know, you know, when we would vote on it or whatnot. But I know that was the original question, so I just was answering. Yeah, it's a it's a good point, Heather. I don't know if you have a comment on that or. Well, that was that was sort of what I was going to say. I was going to come back and circle around to that. And um, you know, we have a board meeting um, next week, next Tuesday. We could. I'm looking at you, Donna, but we could add that to our agenda, right? Um, to just revote on the budget goals and discuss that. We could add that to the agenda. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to look around at board members here um, to see if you want to nod your head yes or. Be like no um to revisit that yeah i'm seeing pretty much consensus so um i'll check in with you tomorrow donna but we'll um we'll add that to our agenda and just revisit that great thank you great i think i think it's important right and i think it's important for the community to see um you know i agree with with Phil that we've got to get these messages out as much as possible. And um, I think prioritizing it just shows that, that, that we care and, and that we want it as well. Um, we want to do it well and safely. Um, and I just, you know, I want to thank you, Donna and Marcy. It sounds like you've had input in this as well quite a bit, but thank you for doing this research. Thank you for making these calls and um, 
contacting commercial real estate agents and thinking through some of the, the possibilities. Um, it's daunting. So thank you. Thank you. And um, Kimberly, you had your hand. Do you, do you have any other questions? You put, you put it down, I think, but I just want to make sure. Yeah, thank you. No, I was just going to circle back to the, the same okay. conversation about if we add it to the goals. Thank you. Yeah, great. Yep. No, I'm happy to see that we'll talk about it on Tuesday a little further on, um, as a goal. So any other questions? So, good. Um, perfect timing. We've got about an hour left and, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Marcy. I know she's got a presentation. Okay, Two different great. topics coming up. Two different topics and I'm going to budget my time, Phil. We've got an hour. So the first topic we'll talk about that's key to everybody's uh, what, what is on our mind every budget season is what will our state subsidy amount be? The state subsidy, which we call uh, state subsidy is, is known as the essential programs and services funding formula. This is the formula established by the Maine Department of Education and they produce a document every year that you've heard us talk about, ED 279. This is the name of the report that the State Department of Education puts together. They have a team of mathematicians that have put together the formula in spreadsheets, uh, about six pages worth of calculations that they do every year. They, they base everything off of information that they receive from each school district. So the most important part of the E279 calculation comes from the data that we provide to the state. So our team in Cape Elizabeth works diligently during September and October to make sure we accurately report to the state our student count, our teachers, other staff members, and all of that data and is taken into account to put together the document that they work on to give to us every February 1st, end of January, February 1st. So that's what, when you hear us talking about ED279 is out, that's, that's what all the buzz is about. It's the Essential Programs and Services Funding Formula document. Basically, in a nutshell too, the ED279 is essentially calculating the amount needed for education in each school district for the state of Maine. They calculate what the expected local contribution should be raised based on their calculations in addition to what they provide to subsidize the property taxes raised to to meet the needs of the students for each district. So that's why they take each individual school district's data because they're calculating what the local property tax contribution should be. And they then determine how much they will contribute after that property tax mill rate is established. Now that means that in school districts such as Cape Elizabeth, the choice can be to um, raise property taxes above their recommended contribution amount, and that's fine. And we report that amount to the state. So the history for the state subsidy over the past 10 years was in one of the graphs that I had in one of the first packets. But I wanted to point out that Cape Elizabeth has survived a point of time where there was a severe cut in, in the funding that was provided um, about 2015, you started to experience significant decreases in the state contribution. This had an impact where it, it started to uh, impact your budget in a way where you had to recover. Now we're at a point for the last three years we we four years, I'm sorry, we're actually started getting an increase in the subsidy. And we have, I would consider it a slight increase in trend, almost flat funding, which is great. Flat, slight increase is what we wanna see. A huge jump is wonderful, right? We would like to see that in the perfect world. But right now we have a trend for the last four years of having 
an increase and a, or even just a slight increase and we'll take it. It's perfect. That's where we wanna be able to hopefully maintain over the next few years because that way we can do financial planning based on at least flat funding and know what to expect from, from the state contribution. Now, this year was an unprecedented year, as we all know, and it was also at the state. The state recognized the unusual situation in all school districts that experienced decreases in a student count. So what happened was they took this into account and they considered it. And instead of just saying, sorry, schools, your, your student counts way down, your, your subsidy is getting decreased. No, they were, they were consider, very considerable towards, um, considerate towards the circumstances. And they did extra calculations outside of what they would normally do. The team worked hard to make sure that school districts across the state got an equitable subsidy allocation. And in our case, they increased our uh, special education funding amount for us to be able to have almost a, a level funding situation. So I, I, was, um, I sent a thank you note to the state team because they worked very hard to make sure that schools didn't take huge dips compared to other districts or huge dips in this year. They know we're, we're trying to do our best to get through some of the hardest times faced in education, right? So they were, um, they, they took that in consideration, not leaving us vulnerable. So I was extremely appreciative of that as I know you all are too, when we got that news. So when we get our document, it's, and this is in your, your budget binders and it's this multicolored report and it's six pages long. The most, all of this is good. This is all great information, very helpful. The first page of this report we use to produce the graph showing our teacher ratio above the recommendation from the essential programs and services formula. So the first page of data is extremely helpful. And this shows all of our student count and our teacher count and other staff. But when Honestly, when I get this report, the, I can tell you the, the very first thing I do is I frantically flip to the section five, which is the second to the last page of the report. This is the, this is the golden ticket right here, section five, because this tells us what our funding amount is. So when we get this report, and if you ever want to know, oh, what was our number again? You can always email me, of course. But if you look at your report in the binder, in section five, they always, they color code it. And it's always in the middle of the page. So your eyes can go right down to adjusted state contribution. That's the line. That's the big ticket. And that is where we, that's the bottom line of our subsidy. That to lead up to that amount, you'll see the chunk at the top of that page. It says adjustment for special education costs. Yes, Dell, where are you? I know you're happy. Um, that's what made our, that's what made us stay level funding this year was that cost. So thank you, Dell. The um, other subsidizable costs that they included were the special education, the gifted and talented costs, and the transportation. So Donna and I were, were thrilled, as we've, we've said to you before, that when we put our eyes on that number in the middle of the page, second to the last page of that report, it was slightly increased from last year and not the huge dip that we were afraid of. So I know that's kind of a, a simplistic view of this um, extremely important and in-depth report, but uh, these, these are the items that I, I focus in on when I'm using this the most. And then when we get close to uh, doing our referendum, 
I have to pay special attention to the uh, actual amount that they list for the local contribution for property taxes. And I have to separate that out compared to what our bottom line property tax amount is. So I'm kind of, I did I rush through that too much, Phil? Because I can back up if you, <laughs> I, I know. No, that no, I, you didn't, but I, I want to make sure that the, uh, if the board has any questions. They, yes, so they let's, have let's some start here. questions. Because I know the next topic is going to be really in detail. So do we have any questions on this one? Anything on the uh, ED 279? Great. I agree. And, um, I don't really have a question. Yeah. I was going to make a request maybe for our next workshop to kind of bring the discussion of ED 279 together with um, staffing and enrollment since, you know, that's the major part of our budget and staffing and enrollment play a large part with ED 279. So it would kind of, they kind of go well together and maybe the principals could be ready to do their discussions about um, how we staff, why we staff, you know, not, based on our um, board policies and best practices and that sort of thing. Um, I know Jeff has done a really great presentation for the last several years showing us um, comparisons, not just in state, but out of state locally in New England and that sort of thing and other um, high achieving school districts. So kind of helping us understand what the ED 279 means not just what it is, which is what Marcy did a great job explaining, but is ED 279 um, how you staff a great school or is ED 279 the absolute mm -hmm. basic? And I know the answer, but um, yeah. I think it's worth having that discussion. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. And actually, um, we are Ha that is going to be on the agenda. So uh, thanks to Heather, actually, um, who suggested it um, because um, she was looking at last year's and speaking for Heather right now, but um, last year's presentations and you had it around March 23rd. That's where we had it on the agenda. So I was already gonna, at the end of this meeting, I was gonna do a sort of call for topics, but we've already put um, staffing and um, enrollment as one of the topics. So I think that kind of presentation That's would be great. great for the next time. Yeah. Especially yep. since Marcy's already given us this primer so that we can. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So it feeds, I think it sort of flows nicely into that conversation. Um, and I just have Heather. to put a plug in for Jeff Shedd's um, presentation because I happen to love it about it. Yeah. I think it yeah. is very eye opening. Me too. And I never get tired of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well good. Well, we're going to get it again. So everyone who hasn't seen it, tune in on March 23rd. Um, any other questions of, on this topic? And I just want okay. to put in, anybody can email me or call me at any time when you have questions about these things too. Anything that comes up, just feel free. Great. Thanks, Marcy. And how about let's move on to the discussion of fund balance. Okay, excellent. So when I start uh, sharing my screen, you guys, I won't be able to see you very well. So what I'm gonna try to do is go slowly and methodically and then jump in, whoever has questions, just feel free to interrupt me. I'll try to pause so that you can just jump in when you have questions along the way. So I won't be able to see your faces once I start sharing my screen. Okay, all right, here we go. Okay. So we are talking about fund balance tonight, the use of fund balance. And specifically, we're, we're really focused on the topic and the term unassigned fund balance. And I think a good analogy and a good way to think of what unassigned fund balance means is if you're thinking about your own personal finances, this would be what you would consider your savings account that you have not committed, okay? So think in terms of that when we're going through this discussion. So we're going to be talking about tonight, the use of the fund balance and these proposals that I have for you all to start thinking about. And I wanna preface this by saying, I've put, I'm putting some numbers on the table. Think in terms of a Rubik's cube right now. And think in terms also of that 
anything you decide is what you decide. What I'm putting out here is, is just recommendations. So you can at any point say, hey, Marcy, we don't like any of these recommendations. Let's go with X or Y. So I just want to say that these are all just the topics and, a, and it's a Rubik's cube and it's something for you all to think about and decide and you ultimately decide how you want to handle this. And I just want to tell you that I'm going to give you an orientation to the first slide because every slide after this is the same, just changing some of the numbers in the box at the top of the slide and the percentages off to the right. And, and the balance. So I just, if we get oriented right now, then you'll um, be able to follow pretty easily along for all the following slides. So what I've done for each one is at the box, I have a scenario one and I've outlined the expenditure scenarios in this box, just to kind of outline what, what the parameters would be. Because then when I go down here in the middle, all of the red boxes represent what would be happening to each number. So let's talk about let's talk about the middle section of this slide first. First box, unassigned fund balance. So this is what we have right now, the audited unassigned fund balance that that was audited and recorded as of June 30th, 2020. So our auditors are telling us, this is what you have right now for your fund balance that you can choose what to do with right here, this 1,141,397. So, oh, that's so funny. I just accidentally did that. Um, the next box next to it is what I'm going to say is recommended uh, from this scenario in the budget out of this unassigned fund balance. Okay, now I wanna draw your eyes down to the bottom box where the arrow is pointing. That is the box where I'm saying, if you used $600,000 in the budget this year, that would leave the remaining fund balance of 541,000. Okay, now that's great. That shows us our balance. If we use the 600,000 out of the 1.1, the little box over here to the, to the far right, we added this because it's this box outlines, the state says that we cannot exceed 3% of our budget in fund balance. So in other words, they don't want us holding on to more than 3% of our operating budget as fund balance. Makes sense, right? Because otherwise people would start holding on to more and more rather than giving back to relieve the property tax payer. So that box outlines that we can't go above 854,000. And the bottom number is just what I'm saying that really a recommended fund balance to maintain would be around, would hover around the 2% rate, which would be that 569,800. Okay. Marcy, can I jump in really quick? Yes. yes. Just because I've been through this, this is my ninth time. It's my last budget season though, folks. So um, <laughs> I, I feel like I just want to jump in quickly because some people might misunderstand about the unassigned fund balance, it's not something like, it's not our contingency fund, right? It's, right. we're only allowed to use it during budget development. We get one chance right. to Correct. use this money. And it's basically whatever was left over if we, we made some great savings or we got some deals and right. we didn't spend things. And that was, it's sort of like at the end of the week if we didn't spend everything that we had budgeted for and that's what went into our savings account. Um, right. So I just wanted to clarify that for people because it, we can't just keep dipping into it. Right, the, right. On the town, I feel, I think there, there's been some misunderstanding because the town council has a similar fund balance 
but they don't have the same restrictions that the schools have? Correct, correct. Is that right? That's correct. They don't have to follow the state statutes that we have to follow right. in our budget warrants. So that's a really great point, Elizabeth. That's why this conversation that we're having um, this budget season is A, I'm happy we're having this conversation because I have colleagues that are having the opposite that yeah. don't have fund balance. So I'm, I, A, I'm ecstatic. B, this is a really critical topic because like you said, Elizabeth, we have to determine during your budget process what the amount will be that you want to use from your unassigned fund balance. We can't go back to it until next budget year. And so that my other question is, over my nine budget seasons, I've actually heard a recommendation to carry anywhere from one to 2%. And so that was my question to you, has different guidance come out or, because this could be a year where if we're trying to shift some priorities that we might wanna, you know, pull an extra 100,000 out of the undesignated fund and put it into contingency or something like that. And, you know, how comfortable are, I mean, and I'm not asking you to say, make any like yes that's fine do that elizabeth but <laughs> like yeah. how comfortable like are falling a little bit below that too since i had heard one to two. Oh yes elizabeth i i completely feel like um for for me i would say i would i wouldn't feel comfortable less than um taking the fund balance less than three hundred thousand dollars which would give you some leeway here um, right. And, and honestly, even if you said, we have to use it all, Marcy, figure out a way. Okay. We would, okay, I would never do that. Okay. <laughs> never. Okay. I don't want to go below 1.5, but I just want to have that conversation too. Yes, As yes. We're going through these slides. I read them. Um, and I appreciate oh, you doing all this work and I just wanted to bring that up. Good. Okay, good. Yes. Um, yes. I, I feel Elizabeth, like even if we got to the point where we really wanted to um, get everything funded and you wanna go below the 2%, then we'll uh, work hard in the next year again or two to try to, to keep on target with it and do what we have to do. I think the bottom line is that uh, working hard to stay on track is the key. If we, if we keep our eyes on the, on, focused on that, then I feel like we can accomplish whatever it is that we strive to accomplish. So, and like you said, there's, there's two aspects, two main functions of fund balance. One is to protect your future. Two, to give back to and relieve the property taxpayer in the current year. So those are your two huge functions of fund balance. Does that make sense? Does, does anybody have a question about that? Okay, because so that's when I'm thinking in terms of our budget, that's what's on my mind. I'm thinking in terms of how do we protect the future for the school, the budget, and how do we make sure that we're giving back to the taxpayers in this current budget year to relieve the property tax rate? Tricky juggling. Actually, act. I just have... Oh, yeah. Yes, before Bill. you move off this slide, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It, just to make it clear, the scenario one is what we what is in the current proposed budget. Yes. So let's okay. like so that's yeah. good, Bill. Let's get back to that. Um, scenario one includes everything that has been requested. No movement from expenditures. And for your reference in the slides, we noted the actual page where these expenditures show up so that you can see where the concept design is budgeted. You can see how the school nutrition deficit amount shows up. And I wanna also point out that when you look at the budget on page 25 for school nutrition, you will see the number of 392.509 because 100,000 of it is your normal property tax contribution on top of the, the deficit amount. Okay, so scenario one, Everything as presented gets funded. We budget $600,000 for fund balance right here in the middle. And it would lead to the 7.15% for expenditure change increase. And it would give an increase of a 6.5% for property tax rate. 
leaving your balance of 541. Okay, any questions about that before I show scenario two? Okay, scenario two. Uh, it's a trick of the eye because I use my arrow key, but yes, I change slides. It's not, not much has changed from scenario one to scenario two. The only thing I wanted to show is that if you increase the budgeted fund balance amount by 700,000, you obviously are decreasing the little balance down here where it leaves you 441,000, but this property tax rate gets decreased to a 6.1% change. That's the number that moves right there because when we change the fund balance budget, it impacts the property tax rate. So in this case, in the scenarios up here in two, I haven't touched anything on the expenditure side. I just increased on the funding formula side. Okay. And I still feel like that would be a comfortable balance. It hovers around that 2%. Right, Elizabeth, I think that's a good way to say it. Hovering around the 2% is the way I look at it too. If we're close to it, we're doing a good job. Okay, mm -hmm. scenario three. Scenario three, I started to change some of the expenditure situations. Scenario three, I propose that, and again, these are just because I'm showing you numbers nothing, no judgment on anything, how it should be, just purely numbers. If we were to decrease the requested positions by 240,000, keeping the concept design of 300,000 and reducing the deficit payback by 150,000, using just 600,000 for fund balance right here, it shows you now we have a change in our expenditure increase and we have our change in the property tax rate. Now we're, now here's the rate getting closer to what you guys um, have had in the past down at this rate. And we're still hovering down here. Our, our uh, carryover would, our fund balance would be still at 541. Okay, scenario four. Here's the same scenario with the expenditures on top, the same, increasing the fund balance to 700,000. And it, look, now we're down to the 4.64, let me double check that, yep, 4.64% for our property tax rate right here by increasing that fund balance. Okay, scenario five, all right, drastic. Very, very hard to look at because it's so drastic. Yes, I know. Taking everything down to zero. Now, for the new positions, as Donna talked about before, let's say we got word from um, getting COVID relief money and that could be taken to zero. Then that's, that's, that would be a situation right there that we could do that. Concept design staying at 300. And this scenario is something you, you fully have the decision to make if you took the deficit for school nutrition down to zero. And I'll tell you why. The auditors allow us a three-year payback for our deficit. And I wanted to point out too that I may not have been very clear before, this deficit remains on our books. So in other words, we're paying the school nutrition fund back, which is a separate fund, but it's within our financials. It's not a state fund at that point. So if you choose not to pay it back this year, I think we had a question before from Jen that is there interest? No, the good news is there would be no interest charged, um, but we're just kind of like, carrying it down the road, we're still gonna be facing it next year. That would be the issue with having it at zero paid back this year. It makes these rates look good right here at 4.45% and the 3.58, but it would be, a, it would be tricky. Um, we, could, we could do it, we could work hard and dig in for the next year, but it won't go away. So that's the only thing and we'll be adding to it for this year. 
Okay, then the last slide shows what would happen if you took out the positions, the school nutrition deficit, adding 700,000, it would take the rates down to this percentage right here, the 4.45 for expenditures and the 3.19% for the property tax rate, leaving that as the balance. Now, if you took everything, if you took the concept design out as well, it would, it would take it even lower. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, use that as a scenario. I probably should have just gone one step further on that for slide seven, but- No, because that can't come out. Right, I think it's very important. Marcy, you've already killed us, it's enough. <laughs> okay. Yes, that can't, that can't come out. Okay. We've, got, we've gotten this far, we, that has to be in. Okay, I won't so vote for a budget that doesn't have that in it. Well, it's a good thing, Heather, that I did not do slide seven. <laughs> I stopped paying attention at slide. It's like, I mean, come on, we're not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know that these are really. I got a little harsh. I'll go back to one. <laughs> um. All right. So, but they are so great for comparison. I am one yes. that really appreciates comparison. Thank you. So, thank you yes. for taking the time and yeah, creating no, different agree. possibilities. But oh well, yes, yeah. totally. I, I, I. That's why I wanted to say to you guys. Uh, by no means am I saying any of those suggestions as something. I just want you to see how numbers look when you start moving things around, primarily. And you could do other combinations. Exactly, exactly. We could do other combinations. Um, I, could, I can move those numbers around all day long. So, um, and I use Elizabeth's favorite um, report to do that, Elizabeth. So that's the one that I use to do all these little number games to come up with the rates, just in case you guys are wondering, the tool that I'm using is that long uh, spreadsheet that we have, that we have in your uh, budget workbook that's called Budget Impact. And it's the best tool, I love it. That, thank you, Elizabeth. So that's what I do to play numbers to get different percentages. And um, you know, you can, if you, if you think of some different combinations along the way, email me, I'll plug them in and I'll tell you what it comes out to be. Yeah. So, so that, I mean, in, in my world, it's really important that you make a decision about what to do about this as soon as possible because it does impact the work that we do moving forward on the budget. So, so you want me to have... stop screen sharing, Donna? Um, that's fine with me if, if other people yeah, that's want. that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So I have, I have it in paper. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I printed and it. I, I shared it. I updated it. Um, I'm sorry to bombard you with so many copies of this, you guys. What I really wanted you to have was the most recent copy because the town increased their value, their valuation. So that's why the property tax rate went down. Our percentage increase went down it was very helpful that the valuation went up from the town. So I, it was cutting edge information yesterday. I wanted to get that in there. It was a significant difference in the percentage increases. So that's why I was going a little crazy on you with that. Yeah, that's a good point because um, I hadn't picked that up. Because, so this, the first sheet in our, just so everyone understands the funding tax impact, I think we don't have an updated version of this long holdout. So right. I think are you, what you're saying to me is that like the, um, instead of 7.18, it's 7.15 now and increase in property tax is not 7.03, it's 6.5 exactly. as, as is, as proposed right now. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think, I think what I'm going to do is um, this week, send you all a packet and I can mail this to everybody too in the mail, snail mail. I know it's old fashioned, but at least it gets to you nice and paper copy with the three hole punches and addendums to your folders of the budget impact history, the new uh, budget reports of where we are right now after we made some changes, and a new summary sheet of the positions after Kathy had proposed her change last week. So I think if you, yeah. don't, if you all don't mind, I'm gonna put that in the mail for you in a packet, and that way you can just put it in your notebook and you can have it during the month of March and April to work with. Yeah, no, that would be very helpful. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have a question? Um, I was just going to follow up on 
Donna's request to kind of make a decision around the fund balance as soon as possible. And um, yeah. I completely understand that I get because it, it plays a big role in, oh, you know, when the board does come back and ask you to perhaps revise the budget. Um, I, I don't know that I feel prepared to do that tonight. Um, I think but, that- Yeah, I think the food nutrition puzzle piece is the next piece to make a decision yeah. about. Yeah. On what I just, do because it could be that, you know, I think that we need to have a conversation around um, contingency funding because I think that could be a way of um, perhaps budgeting for something that we don't know exactly what it costs yet. And then it's not per specifically in the budget so that if we do get COVID fund, you know what I mean? Like it's a, mm -hmm. it, it gives us flexibility. And so that the fund balance and contingency are really weighing heavily in my mind right now. And um, I just feel like the board might need another, like oh. a little more with that and a lot yeah. around yeah, that. No, definitely. Yeah. But I, I totally understand that you guys need this because when we give you that, that, hey, please revise it down to this, you need to know, okay, how much are we allowed to pull out of exactly. designated funds? So yeah. I hear you. Yeah, I'm, 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 I need a little time too, yeah, you know, because particularly on the school nutrition deficit part, because I think you know, in an ideal world, I'd like to pay it all down, but we may, may, may need to make different decisions as we start to see some members come in and, mm -hmm. and maybe we do have to, I wouldn't want to put zero. I wouldn't, I don't like the last scenario. I know it's for conversation purposes. Um, <clears throat> I'd want to make a dent in it, but we may want to move some things around or put some in contingency, like you said, Elizabeth. Um, so anyway, that's something for us to think about. Yeah, Elizabeth. Sorry. <laughs> um, Marcy, is there, uh, um, like, just for us to start thinking about, it, it's not for us to necessarily say tonight, but um, kind of a, like a recommendation either from uh, Jen at uh, whatever the auditors every year, mm -hmm. um, RKO. <clears throat> RKO, right. <laughs> yeah. In yourself or, you know, as you're, you know, the business man managers that you're in touch with, because it seems like almost every school department is in the mm -hmm. same boat. Yes. So I guess I'm just kind of curious as to like, if we could start taking a whack at this, I agree with Bill, I, I don't feel comfortable with the zero either. So mm -hmm. what's, it's sort of like, what's best practice? Like that's mm -hmm. the, up here and then what's okay. And then okay. what's really not a good idea, you know? Okay, <laughs> okay, I, I, I have the answer for you, Elizabeth. Um, because I've had this conversation with Jen from RKO. Best practice, zero, zero it out. 100% fund the deficit. Okay, great. Best practice. Medium, middle of the road. You, uh, two, two middle of the roads. Half, right in half, or thirds. Because last year, Jen and I had a conversation, and she said that last year when we were facing the deficit, a third, a third, a third over, over a three year period, basically taking three years to pay it off. Um, worst practice would be zero. Does that help? I think that gives, I think middle Absolutely. of the road. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I'm, I'm getting the sense that maybe middle of the road is where you all are thinking. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But so yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Well, could you tell me, and you may have already said this once, but what have we done? What did we do last year? Last year we did, we, we attempted to do a third fill. We, it was mm -hmm. $105,000 or 105,000 at that time for the previous year audit to deficit. And we attempted to do a third. It ended up being that that wasn't enough. So it was kind of like the scenario was saying that by this, by this June, Right now, I think Peter and I are trying to uh, keep the numbers under $100,000 for our deficit by the year end, hopefully less. I'm hoping my forecast trend is, is off and we'll be under that amount, but that's what we did. Mm -hmm. But again, Phil, that was, and I wanna point out that that was a, a $40,000 increase, I believe, from the year before. So you have been incrementally getting there, 
we're making progress. We're, we really are towards the school nutrition program to keep it at a positive year in balance. Mm -hmm. 40,000 last year was the increase. Um, this year, it looks like it's gonna be something of an increase that way. So, and we're at a solid 100,000. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. So in other words, I want, and I'm not even trying to have it with rose colored glasses. We really are moving towards the right direction. Mm -hmm. I hear, oh, kitty. <laughs> Any other questions about this? All right, I think you uh, did a great job. We ha Heather. Oh, Heather. Just like a last minute, and I don't have the answer, but I just, as I think about this, I also am keeping in mind that we are hoping to go for a bond June uh, 2022, yep. so a year from this June. So we're gonna be asking you know, uh, citizens for that much more money to support a building project. I just, I, mm -hmm. I keep that in mind as I consider this, like. Mm, good point. Um, you know, maybe it is worth paying more now um, so that we're not adding that on top of the bond. Again, I don't know where I stand with that. I just want to remind people that that is looming as well. Right. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you, Marcia. It was very helpful. Um, a lot of us, a lot for us to think about, and I know we will. Um, I know. Uh, next, any any other suggestions for the next agenda? So we're gonna we have a couple different decisions to make, obviously. So we're gonna have to continue to talk about this fund balance issue, and um, and honestly, one thing that I look at, and I know we all do, we all did last year, is is when we get this new updated sheet. If you can see what I'm showing. Just, you know, that's obviously at the end of the day, very important, um, the percentage, um, the percentage increases on both the tax base and the overall budget. So that's something to keep in mind. And I don't know, Don and Marcy, I don't remember where in the, maybe even Elizabeth, where in the timeline we kind of gave our preference on that, but that's a looming, looming issue too, in terms of where, where we don't want to go any higher than kind of number. Um, I don't know if that's at the next meeting. We're not or if there that's, yet. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple more, but we, we only right. have three more scheduled. Yeah, so it's, we're, we we're moving along. We don't do that until we've heard the um, insurance. At least we get the we get the floor and yes. ceiling yes. on insurance yep. before we make that call, because it feel before that we really don't have all the information. Right. And is that early April, Donna? Usually, yeah. uh, the ceiling usually comes sometime in March, and then we get our final usually the first week in April. So it's right before the vote. So we can't. That's yeah, right. usually by the by the time we get the ceiling, we can. Yeah, make we that can lower it a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So to the extent that we have that, I think I remember that coming in right before that last that March end of March meeting last year. To the extent it comes in, we can have a discussion about that at our next meeting, this, the insurance side of things. Um, so in enrollment, so, so far next time, I think we're gonna talk about enrollment and staffing presentations. I agree with Heather, I love to see that. And that's, it's good for everybody to see again. Um, I like the tie in with ED, ED 279 that Elizabeth suggested. So we'll maybe pull that back in again. And then in insurance, if we have that information, um, any other calls for topics for next time? If you think of anything, email me. We, so I told you, I wrote an email this week, but just so everyone knows that we, Heather and Donna and Marcy and I now have a standing Friday morning meeting to talk about, um, to talk about schedules and, and agendas um, throughout the remainder of the budget season. So email me suggestions if you, if you have any, and we'll, I'll bring them up at those meetings. We'll get something on the agenda for the next time as well. Um, we'll go a little early. Well, maybe contingency funding. Contingency funding, good, yep. I, I don't even um, see, I looked quickly through the tabs, but um, I'm not even clear at this moment what our contingency line is. Marcy, are we at one or 130? Uh, 100,000 for contingency. Okay, so we'll wanna for talk 100. about that. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely wanna talk about that. 
And I'd say, depending on, it sounds like we sort of have an agreement to talk about our budgeting goals um, next Tuesday. So depending on if we add that add additional goal, I think we should, just like we do at our normal our regular meetings, I think we should have a standing discussion on COVID, COVID budgeting as well. Um, Maybe an, up, uh, an update uh, to what we heard tonight, for example, on that so issue. I I just want to point out, Elizabeth brought up a good point just now. If anybody's ever curious to find the contingency line item account, it's on yeah. page 25. It's the very last line item of our budget. Easy to find. It's our very last line item. And it's actually called contingency account 9075 and conveniently called contingency account. And it's at 100,000 right now. Okay. And is that Thank a, you, is Marcy, that a number? I hadn't found it. Yeah. It's yes. a very convenient location. Is that is yes. that the, is that what we typically put in there, or is that is that a typical number? Yeah. That's, yes, uh, I think one year you had it at one hundred and fifty three thousand. Okay. So to the must, I think at, at that time, Elizabeth, that must have been a plan just to make sure that you had it in case you needed it for something. Yeah, there was something specific going around, and and it had something to do with. Um, a bubble in enrollment and a, a, a concern about mm -hmm. staffing. I don't remember. That, that would make sense. Okay. Last call for questions. Looks like nothing then. All right, we'll get out a few minutes early. I think that was a good meeting. Um, and uh, we'll meet again March 23rd and uh, continue to march along. Thanks, thanks everybody. Okay. Thank you. See you next Tuesday. Thank you. Okay.